Okay, so welcome to this third video on strokes and excitotoxicity. Okay, so so far we've seen that if this neuron gets hypoxic because of some sort of ischemic uh, causing incident, such as an occlusive or a hemorrhagic stroke, sorry, then uh, what's going to happen is that ATP within that neuron is going to go down. And if ATP goes down in the axon terminal, what that is going to lead to is the two extrusion mechanisms for uh, calcium going out of business, basically. And these are the two extrusion mechanisms for calcium. There aren't any others, basically, uh, that are notable. Uh, so these two go, to ha go down and calcium is going to go up, basically. So what happens is in this axon terminal, calcium is going to go up. Now, what does calcium going up in an axon terminal usually lead to? It leads to, um, it leads to um, exocytosis of vesicles containing neurotransmitter, basically. Now, let's say this neuron is an excitatory neuron and releases glutamate, which most neurons in the brain do. Uh, so glutamate is the main neurotransmitter of the brain. So it's very likely that this neuron does indeed have glutamate uh, in its axon terminal. So let's say we have glutamate in this axon, uh, in this um, synaptic vesicle here. And basically what's going to happen is, um, shall we try and draw the core complex again? Uh, yes, we'll have a go. Okay, so the synaptic vesicles are docked at this presynaptic membrane by a whole protein complex, basically. Um, so we'll talk about these little protein complexes because it doesn't hurt to revise things. Uh, so blue is usually the color I use for synaptotagmin, which we're not ready for yet. So one of the um, V-snares, which means uh, vesicular snare, so the proteins involved in the uh, complex of proteins which holds uh, this synaptic vesicle to the presynaptic membrane are called snares. And there have to be two forms of snares. There have to be some snares which are in the synaptic vesicle and some snares which are on the presynaptic membrane. And then they're going to interact and then that's going to ca cause the um, synaptic vesicle to be held to the presynaptic membrane. Now, one of the V snares, which is one of these vesicular snares, is uh, called synaptobrevin. Okay, so this is synaptobrevin that I'm showing here, which is one of these uh, V snares that is um, implanted into the membrane of the synaptic vesicle. And it consists basically of a single alpha helix. Now, another uh, snare protein involved in the core complex is called syntaxin. And syntaxin is instead a snare that's implanted into the plasma membrane. So instead of being in the synaptic vesicle membrane, it's actually on the postsynaptic, well, presynaptic membrane. Uh, and it's um, because it's on the presynaptic membrane, it's instead called a T snare, standing for target snare. So this is a syntaxin molecule. Okay, and it's a, a T snare protein. T snare. Okay, and again, it consists of a single uh, alpha helix, and basically these alpha helices are going to interact. The alpha helix of synaptobrevin is going to interact with the alpha helix of syntaxin, and they're going to form like a nice complex. So synaptobrevin was a t uh, V snare rather than a T snare, standing for vesicular snare. Okay, right. And then the final uh, snare protein that's involved in the formation of this core complex um, is called SNAP25, and it consists of two alpha helices. So I'll draw it like so. So two alpha helices like that. And again, it's a T-snare, so it's implanted into um, the, um, the plasma membrane rather than the membrane of the synaptic vesicle. So this green protein, which consists of two alpha helices, is called SNAP25. And basically, these four alpha helices, one each from synaptobrevin and syntaxin, and two from SNAP25, are going to join together and sort of form a nice complex, and that's going to hold, um, hold the uh, synaptic vesicle to the plasma membrane. And you don't just form one of these complexes, which is why I've drawn two of them. You, draw, you form many of them, which are all holding this synaptic vesicle to the plasma membrane. Now, the final important snare is another one that doesn't form part of this core complex, as it's called. So this is a core complex, uh, but instead uh, is involved in actually 
causing this synaptic vesicle to fuse with the presynaptic membrane, and it's a snare protein called synaptotagmin. So this protein here is called synaptotagmin, and I'll draw two of them, and I always colour it in blue. Synaptotagmin here. Right, so that's the synaptotagmin protein here. So I'll just label it up. Right, synaptotagmin. And basically what happens is that the calcium binds to synaptotagmin, and we will study exactly how calcium binds to synaptotagmin and exactly how synaptotagmin works. But calcium binds to synaptotagmin, and that causes... Uh, synaptotagmin changes its conformation and interferes with the membrane and causes uh, this vesicle to fuse with the membrane, and that causes the contents of this vesicle to become continuous with the, uh, the synaptic cleft space here, and the glutamate is then released into the synaptic cleft. Okay, so overall, when neurons become hypoxic, they release glutamate. Glutamate is an excitatory neurotransmitter. So this is where the excito of excitotoxicity comes from. So basically, when, the when, the, when a portion of the brain becomes ischemic, all the neurons there become hypoxic, and all of those neurons start releasing glutamate. And this is not good. Glutamate is going to cause excessive um, activation of other neurons, and it's basically going to cause calcium levels within those other neurons to get even higher, and that's going to, that high calcium level is basically going to kill the neurons. Okay, so let's continue our story. Right, okay, so turn over the page. So, at the moment, what we have is that glutamate is going up. So that's where we've got to so far in the story now. Glutamate goes up. Now, what we need now is to look at the postsynaptic cell and the receptors uh, for glutamate in the postsynaptic cell. Okay, so let's say um, this is now a dendritic spine, maybe, of uh, the postsynaptic cell. Okay, so usually what happens is that postsynaptic cells have two types of glutamate receptors, and generally um, the first is an AMPA receptor, although it can in some cases be kinate receptors, so I'll draw the AMPA receptor. The AMPA receptor consists of four subunits, um, four subunits which form the member, well, which form the pore forming unit, so this is an AMPA receptor here, okay? And the other form of receptor that you have in the membrane is an NMDA receptor, which again consists of four subunits here. So let's have the NMDA receptor drawn here. Right, okay, and they, again you've got four subunits forming the membrane uh, spanning region, uh, or the pore forming region. And uh, in this case, two of those subunits will be a very specific uh, uh, NMDA receptor component or subunit, which is the um, M uh, glu N1 subunit. So I'll, I'll just uh, have a brief reminder of the NMDA receptor structure. So basically, the NMDA receptor is made up of these four subunits, and two of them have to always be glu N1 subunits, like so. So glu N1, these are glu N1 subunits. The other two are going to be non glu N1 subunits. So these two are non glu N1 subunits. And basically, um, the glu N1 subunits don't bind glutamate. Instead, they bind glycine or D-serine. So glycine, glycine or D-serine bind uh, to the ligand binding domains of these glu N1 subunits. And then the two non glu N1 subunits, those do bind glutamate. Now, glycine is usually very high uh, in the extracellular space, so uh, these glu N1 subunits usually continuously have glycine bound to their ligand binding domains. So to activate the NMDA receptor, in fact, all you have to do is bind two glutamates to it, one to each of the non glu N1 subunits, basically. Okay, now, AMPA receptors, meanwhile, they consist of four subunits which all bind glutamate. So to activate the AMPA receptor, you have to bind four glutamates. Uh, well, it's a bit more complicated than that, but for our purposes, you have to... Well, actually, I'll talk about it. Um, what has been found with AMPA receptors 
is that there are three conductance states, basically. Amper receptors can be in three different levels of conductance. One which is a low level, two which is a medium level, and three which is a high level. Now, it is not understood what the molecular basis of this is. What you would have expected is for there to be four conductance states, i.e. if one glutamate binds to the amper receptor, i.e. one of the subunits has um, an, a glutamate bound to its amper, it's going to open the pore a little bit and that will allow a tiny current through there. And then if two bind to different um, subunits, then um, you're going to get a slightly wider pore if you get three subunits bound to glutamate, that's going to widen the pore still further, and then four would be the full conductance, but you only find three, basically. And what we do know is that you don't need... Uh, the, the fact that there are three different conductance states illustrates that you don't need four glutamates to actually get any conductance at all. If you have four glutamates, you'll have full conductance, but you don't need four glutamates bound there to actually trigger any conductance at all. However, for our purposes, four glutamates combined to that. I mean, in excitotoxicity, the whole point is that we are, you know, gl we're having glutamates all over the place. So four glutamates are probably going to bind to that. Okay, so glutamate is going to come in. It's going to bind and activate these AMPA receptors here. It's also going to bind and activate the NMDA receptors down here. So you're going to get activation of the AMPA receptors and of the NMDA receptors. Now, uh, initially, this dendritic spines electrical potential difference across the membrane is negative 65 millivolts. Now, when the intracellular compartment is more has a more negative electrical potential than the extracellular compartment, then the magnesium cations in the extracellular uh, fluid basically they want to get in to um, the intracellular compartment uh, because it's got a lower electrical potential. And they can move through the NMDA receptor pore, well, they can try at least, and basically they do that. If the electrical potential uh, is too much lower in the intracellular compartment than the extracellular compartment, then there's enough of a driving force for these magnesium ions to tr have a go at getting through the NMDA receptor. And basically, when the glutamate binds to the NMDA receptor, that causes the NMDA receptor to open. But if the resting membrane, if the electrical potential difference across the membrane is too negative, which negative 65 is, it's anything between negative 80 and negative 20 that this magnesium will have a go, basically. Uh, so this magnesium is going to go into that pore and it's going to block it straight away, basically. So you're not going to get any conductance through the NMDA receptor, at least not initially. However, you are going to get a conductance through the AMPA receptor. So when the glutamate binds, the AMPA receptor is going to open and that's going to allow positive, uh, positive charge to move into the cell. So sodium ions on the outside are going to come in through the receptor and go into the cytoplasm, basically. At the same time, you are going to get a little bit of the movement of potassium out, but basically the movement of sodium in beats the movement of potassium out and you overall get a net movement of positive charge through the amper receptor into the intracellular compartment. Okay, so basically this is going to cause depolarization of the intracellular compartment. Okay, and we'll continue our discussion in the next video.